Chapter 13. Homily was ironing, bending and banging and pushing the hair back out of her eyes. All round the room, underclothes hung airing on safety pins, which Homily used like coat hangers. What happened? asked Homily. Did you fall over? Yes, said Arietti, moving quietly into her place beside the fire. How's the feeling coming? Oh, I don't know, said Arietti. She clasped her knees and laid her chin on them. Where's your knitting? asked Homily. I don't know what's come over you late lately, always idle. You don't feel seedy, do you? Oh, exclaimed Arietti, let me be. And Homily, for once, was silent. It's the spring, she told herself. You used to take me like that sometimes at her age. I must see that boy, Arietti was thinking, staring blindly into the fire. I must hear what happened. I must hear if they're all right. I don't want us to die out. I don't want us to be the last borrower. I don't want... And here, Arietti dropped her face onto her knees. To live forever and ever like this, in the dark, under the floor. No good getting supper, said Homily, breaking a silence. Your father's gone borrowing. To her room. And you know what that means. Arietti raised her head. No, she said, hardly listening. What does it mean? That he won't be back said homily sharply for a good hour and a half he likes it up there gossiping with her and poking about on the dressing table and it's safe enough once that boy is in bed not that there's anything we want special she went on it's just these new shelves he's made they look kind of bare he says and he might he says just pick up a little something arietti suddenly was sitting bolt upright a thought had struck her leaving her breathless and a little shaky at the knees a good hour and a half her mother had said, and the gates would be open. Where are you going? asked Homily, as Arietti moved towards the door. Just along to the storerooms, said Arietti, shading with one hand her candle dip from the draught. I won't be long. Now don't you untidy anything, Homily called out after her, and be careful of that light. As Arietti went down the passage, she thought, it is true, I am going to the storerooms to find another hat pin. And if I do find a hat pin and a piece of string, there won't be any name tape. I still won't be long because I'll have to get back before Papa. And I'm doing it for their sakes, she told herself doggedly. And one day, they'll thank me. All the same, she felt a little guilty. Artful. That's what Mrs Driver would say she was. There was a hat pin, one with a bar for a top. And she tied on a piece of string very firmly, twisting it back and forth like a figure of eight. And as a crowning inspiration, she sealed it with sealing wax. The gates were open, and she left the candle in the middle of the passage, where it would come to no harm, just below the hole by the clock. The great hall, where she had climbed out into, into it, was dim with shadows. A single gas jet, turned low, made a pool of light beside the lock front door, and, and another faintly flickered on the landing halfway up the stairs. The ceiling sprang away into height and darkness, and all around was space. The night nursery, she knew, was at the end of the upstairs passage, and the boy would be in bed. Her mother had just said so. Arietti had watched her father use his pin on the chair and single stairs, in comparison, were easier. There were no kind of rhythm to it, after a while. A throw, a pull, a scramble, and an upward swing. The stair rods glinted coldly, but the pile of the carpet seemed soft and warm and delicious to fall back on. On the half landing, she paused to get a breath. She did not mind the semi-darkness. She lived in darkness. She was at home in it, and at and a time like this, it made her feel safe. On the upper landing, she saw an open door and a great square of golden light, which, like a barrier, lay across the passage. I've got to pass through that, Arietti told herself, trying to be brave. Inside the lighted room, a voice was talking, droning on. And this mare, said the voice said, was a five-year-old, which really belonged to my brother in Ireland. Not my elder brother, but my younger brother, the one who owns Stalemate and Oh My Darling. He had entered her for several points to points, but when I say several, I mean three, or at least two. Have you ever seen an Irish point to point? No, said another voice, rather absent-mindedly. That's my father, Arietti realised with a start. My father was talking to Great Aunt Sophie, or rather, Great Aunt Sophie was talking to my father. She gripped her pin 
with its loops of string and ran into the light and threw it to the passage beyond. As she passed the open door, she had a glimpse of firelight and lamplight and gleaming furniture and dark red silk brocade. Beyond the square of light, the passage was dark again, but she and she could see at the far end a half-open door. That's the day nursery, she thought, and beyond that is the night nursery. There are certain differences, Aunt Sophie's voice went on, which would strike you at once. For instance, Arietti liked the voice. It was comforting and steady, like the sound of a clock in the hall, and as she moved off the carpet onto the strip of polished floor beside the skirting board, she was interested to hear there were walls in Ireland instead of hedges. Here, by the skirting, she could run, and she loved running. Carpets were heavy going, thick and clinging, they held you up. The boards were smoothed and smelled of beeswax. She liked the smell. The schoolroom, when she reached it, was shrouded in dust sheets and full of junk. Here too, a gas jet burned, turned low to a bluish flame. The floor was oilcloth, rather worn, and the rugs were shabby. Under the table was a great cavern of darkness. She moved into it, feeling about and bumped into a dusty hassock higher higher than her head. Coming out again into the half-light, she looked up and saw the corner cupboard with the doll's tea service, the painting above the fireplace and the plush curtain where her father had been seen. Chair legs were everywhere and chair seats obscured her view. She found her way among them to the door of the night nursery and there she saw, suddenly, on a shadowed plateau in the far corner, the boy in bed. She saw his great face turned turn towards her on the edge of the pillow. She saw the gaslight reflected in his open eyes. She saw his hand gripping the bedclothes, holding them tightly, pressed against his mouth. She stopped moving and stood still. After a while, when she saw his fingers relax, she said softly, Don't be frightened. It's me, Arietti. He let the bedclothes slide away from his mouth and said, Ari, what He seemed annoyed. Etty, she repeated gently. Did you take the letter? He stared at her for a moment without speaking. Then he said, Why did you come creeping, creeping into my room? I didn't come creeping, creeping, said Arietti. I even ran. Didn't you see? He was silent, stating at her with his great white open eyes. When I brought the book, he said at last, you'd gone. I had to go. Tea was ready. My father fetched me. He understood this. Oh, he said matter of factly, and he did not reproach her. Did you take the letter? She asked again. Yes, he said. I had to go back twice. I shoved it down the badger's hole. Suddenly he threw back the the bedclothes and stood up in a bed, enormous in his pale flannel nightshirt. It was Arietti's turn to be afraid. She half turned, her eyes on his face, and began backing slowly towards the door. But he did not look at her. He was feeling behind a picture on the wall. Here it is, he said, sitting down again, and the bed creaked loudly. But but I don't want it back, exclaimed Arietti, coming forward again. You should have left it there. Why did you bring it back? He turned it over in his fingers. He's written on it, he said. Oh, p- please, cried Arietti excitedly. Show me. She ran right up to the bed and tugged at the trailing sheet. Then they are alive. Did you see him? No, he said. The letter was there, just down the hole where I put it. He leaned towards her. But he's written on it. Look. She made a quick dart and almost snatched the letter out of his great fingers, but was careful to keep out of range of his hand. She ran with it to the door of the schoolroom where the light, though dim, was a little brighter. It's very faint, she said, holding it close to her eyes. What's he written it with? I wonder. It's all in capitals, she turned suddenly. Are you sure you didn't write it? she asked. Of course not, he began. I write small. But she had seen by his face that he'd spoke the truth and began to spell out the letters. T E double one. She said, tell you why O-R-E. She looked up. Your, she said. Yes, said the boy, your. Tell your A-N-T, aunt, said Arietti, aunt, my aunt. The boy was silent, waiting. Aunt L-U-O, 
Aunt Loopy, she exclaimed. He says, listen, it is what he says. Tell your Aunt Loopy to come home. There was silence. Then tell her, said the boy after a moment. But she isn't here, exclaimed Arietti. She's never been here. I don't even remember what she looked like. Look, said the boy, staring through the door. Someone's coming. Arietti whipped round. There was no time to hide. It was Pod, borrowing bag in one hand and pin in the other. He stood in the doorway of the schoolroom. Quite still he stood, outlined against the light of the passage, his little shadow falling dimly in front of him. He had seen her. I heard your voice, he said, and there was a dreadful quietness about the way he spoke, just as I was coming out of her room. Arietti stared back at him, stuffing the letter up her jersey. Could he see beyond her into the shadowed room? Could he see the Tuzel shape in the bed? Come on home, said Pod, and turned away.